Good evening, all, and uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in to a wonderful evening. And uh, as promised to all through All India Runners Motivation, today we have our uh, second Olympic medalist. Uh, even though I say second Olympic medalist, the champion runner uh, is first in many aspects. Uh, when it comes to uh, Kenya, we have heard a lot about uh, the athletes from Kenya. Uh, and their prowess in long distance running. Today's athlete whom we are bringing in is an athlete who is a leader in actually uh, in Kenyan athletics. He's a legend. He is a champion long distance runner and he has got many firsts when it comes to Kenya. He was the first uh, um, Olympic medalist for Kenya in marathon. He was the first gold medalist for you know world championship for marathon. So these were the two first for him. He has actually created and paved the way for a lot many runners in Kenya to uh, showcase their skills, especially in long distance running. It's a pleasure. It's a privilege. And with a lot of pride, I would say it's a fanboy moment for me. I would like to introduce uh, to you the very famous runner from Kenya. His name is Douglas Wakihuri. Hey, hi, everyone. Jambo, how are you? Jam Fine, thank you. And uh, namaste <laughs> is what we would say in India. Uh, no, thank you very much for uh, tuning in today. So how is the weather in Nairobi? Perfect for running, I can tell you, because uh, we had, uh, it's, it's a bit hot, but it's good for running. We normally run in the mornings when it's very cool. And in the evening, we're in the forest where it's a bit cooler, but it's about up to 4.30 before it gets dark. But the weather is just lovely. Okay. This is the first time you're uh, speaking to athletes in India? Well, I guess so. Uh, unless those who have Googled me and read me on the newspapers, I think this is the first time, yes. Okay. You passed through India a couple of times, right? Yeah. Uh, when I was, when I finished my high school in 1982, I had an opportunity to go to Japan and actually I passed through Calcutta. Calcutta, I don't know if you call it Calcutta. And uh, it was it was good experience being a high school student just for fresh from school. And I was on my way to Path, uh, going to New Zealand, where I first met uh, my coach, who was Kyoshi Nakamura. Okay, that's nice. Uh, so uh, we have heard a lot about you. Um, and I went through the interviews, what we have, uh, what I've seen in my research. Tell us a bit about your uh, childhood, uh, because your story in athletics is like a movie. You know, so there's a lot of uh, great moments and probably a movie would be made sometimes in the future, uh, uh, featuring your life story and you might star in it. But tell the audience about uh, your childhood and your uh, entry into athletics. Uh, first, I was born in Mombasa. Mombasa is the sea level uh, city, coastal region uh, near the Indian Ocean. And I don't know much about Mombasa because I was there probably up to the five years old. My mom used to work as a prison warden. So she moved to Nyeri, at a city called Nyeri, and then moved to Meru. In Meru, I had very good recollection because uh, where we were in the prison uh, setup, our school was two kilometers away from, uh, from the camp. And we were supposed to walk two kilometers in the morning run back because we had one hour for lunch so we only had to run back quickly so that was about two kilometers would go maybe in like 25 minutes or 20 to 25 minutes then we have a quick lunch and then we walk back and then in the evening we will also walk back so in a day basically i was doing probably eight kilometers in a day and that is in one term in a year it's three times so when uh, after that uh, my mom was transferred in nairobi, in nairobi where she uh, was stationed at a, a, a Langata women's prison. It was a women's prison. And next to the prison, there was a very huge forest. So in the Langata women's prison, I met the Langata women's prison athletic team. So I used to follow them and train with them. And it, it became uh, part of my day-to-day -day continuing from, from school, where we used to compete as young boys. And then, uh, of course, Wilson Waigua, as, as my uncle, then that was around 1971. He had already gone to the US and he had uh, encouraged me and told me that, look, 
if you do well, probably I will get you a scholarship to the U.S. And and really that uh, just took me up the next level. And training was uh, part of my day to day life. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, at what age actually you you know uh, you became uh, really uh, serious in running? Uh, before before even I finished my high school, I was actually uh, competing in the national cross country. I remember the year that I went to Japan in 1983. 82, I was in the national cross country team and I had qualified for the junior world cross country championship. But uh, when I finished the high school, my high school in Japan. So for me, it wasn't uh, that uh, I had to choose, but I believe that uh, given an opportunity out there, I'll become a better runner. And there's a couple of reasons why we think like that. Number one, there is a lot of negativity of when better athletes look upon young and upcoming athletes. Instead of encouraging them, they demoralize them. So for me, there was that narration that uh, uh, from some of the runners that uh, I am no good, I can't become a good runner, so I'm just wasting my time. And for me, I developed the strength in the negativity, and I told them, one day, I'm going to be an Olympian. I don't know how, but that was the, the, the key for me to just think that uh, if I get out of this place that I'm being mad, that I am useless, I will one day become somebody who's, uh, who's going to be uh, understood and seen and, and probably be who I am today. Okay. Uh, so did your uncle, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson uh, Waigua, he actually, uh, you know, um, uh, influenced you? He gave me a lot of hope and courage in, in one way or another. And one of the most important things he did is he gave me running gear. He could be bring me some shoes, very nice shoes. And you know, when we are growing up, wearing a tracksuit was like a... a, a, a you know, like like some very, very, very luxury life. And one of the things that I remember is that when we used to train there, sometimes I could join other teams like the post office team would go with them to train. One day we were doing a session up the hill, you do the hill reps, which we call hill reps, you go down the hill, you come up 10 times. And on top of the hill, the coach, you hear the coach, you ask where the trucks would come from. So. That, that that sentence by itself really, really put me in, in a very understanding position that unless you work hard, there is nothing which is going to come for free or easy. Okay. So um, at the age of 19, uh, you decided to be an uh, Olympian. Uh, uh, apart from your uncle, Wilson Waigua, anybody else influenced you at that time? We had very good uh, runners then. We could see like uh, the late Abebe Bikla. Uh, he was a legend to us. We we're looking forward to him. We had uh, Henry Rono and, and other great athletes in the world. But those are some of the great runners that we looked upon because they were just ahead of us and, and we were very young. And, uh, okay. and uh, about, uh, you know, that, that really uh, when, what I never knew is is what event I will run, but for sure, my heart was said. This is this is something I want to do from deep inside my heart. Okay, so how many uh, Olympians are there in your family apart from uh, you and your uncle? Only the only two of us. <laughs> only two of you. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, that's nice. So you are, I know at the age of 19, you know, suddenly uh, from being in uh, in Kenya, you decided to travel to uh, to meet your uh, the, the the coach who actually helped to shape your life and uh, make you what you are, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi Nakamura. It's like a movie story. Yeah. So tell us a bit about the whole journey. How did it start? First of all, how did you hear about a Japanese coach? And, uh, you know, what made you travel all the way from uh, where you are uh, to meet him or where you were to meet him? Uh, number one is that we had uh, we had a Japanese coach or athletics lover who was in Kenya from 1969 to 70s. And he used to go to every event. 
So he used to see me competing in uh, different events and he never thought I was talented. He only thought I am a hardworking athlete. So I, I had read about Chushi Nakamura in a magazine that was written by an American uh, media. And uh, he was called Maya, I think somebody Maya. So when we discussed about it, he said, yeah, I think uh, I can work something out to, so that And this action now began through Mr. Kobayashi, who lived, he's still here in Kenya, he loves Kenya, he's been here. And the connection started there. And when, when the, all that worked up, he came to me and said, look, Douglas, I have an opportunity here. The coach, the coach has agreed and you're going to Japan. And I can't express my joy when I heard I'm going to Japan after, just after high school. It was like a dream come true. Uh, so I, I, I went back and told my mom, uh, mom, but I will come back. That is the last words I said to my mom. And my mom told me, you know, uh, since we are not there to take care of you, whoever you, you stay with will become your father and will be your mother. So just do the very best you can. And I think that was a good uh, uh, departure. I was, as I said, it was my first time to build the plane. I was only 19 years. I couldn't understand. I, I just couldn't figure out everything because even a vehicle for us was a bit uh, a bit complicated just to understand the vehicle system. So leave, leave alone the plane. So I was in the plane. I see a lot of people and uh, uh, Mr. Kobayashi's wife and a uh, one-year-old son were the one to escort me all the way to New Zealand. And okay. we, we, we boarded the plane. We landed in Calcutta, Calcutta, and and uh, we had the transit there. Of course, we had the, the, the you know to see just different uh, environment, different people. Then we flew to Perth and all the way to New Zealand. And and when I arrived in New Zealand, I was very very determined, but I did not understand even the training system that uh, the Japanese were doing because for me it was do or die. For them, it is a reputation. So. I did not understand any Japanese at the point, and uh, luckily they had assistant coach who was called uh, Mr. Murao, and Mr. Murao could understand a bit of English. So it was I was very lucky just to have Mr. Murao around to translate all the the, the the program that are supposed to be done. Because at the beginning, of course, I will miss this translated because we a very a competitive uh, community and. Whatever we do, we go out flat out, you know. And, and uh, in time, in time, I, I started learning how to use the chopsticks. And it was put put the beans in the glass and try to pick one bean out and then put the other bean back. And that is how they started teaching me a little bit of things. Of course, when you're learning a new language, they tell you the worst the worst uh, words, <laughs> which you they love. It they say maybe you say you are they say this word in Japanese you say. You say you know what it means it means you're stupid you know those are the kind of uh that's the way i learned but um, for me i think going there and having not have had a father life with, with in all my life i think mr nakamura made made a very good father uh, to me and i think that is the peace in life that missed that i had missed as as i grew up okay that's wonderful i mean in fact uh your Japanese is so good that you have recorded albums uh, in uh, in the in the language. As Liz McColgan told me uh, last time, that you were a you were a pop star in Japan. How did that happen? Don't know. I I first uh, went to Japan in '83. I stayed for six years. Then I I, I left Japan, and I was traveling here in New Zealand, Britain, and everywhere. But then I again went back to Japan for music this time round. And uh, it was from 2005 to 2007, where I, I performed live performances. And one of the performances World Athletics in Japan in 2007. That one I was given an opportunity to entertain the International Athletic Association uh, uh, I think the dinner party, I was the main entertainer. And that was a, also another opportunity 
you know, and 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 I think we we as athletes should not limit ourselves into just running. I think we can expand ourselves. We can become musicians. We can become uh, filmmakers. We can become anything that we want to do because you don't have to die to die running. Okay, that's wonderful. So uh, your uh, your uh, association with uh, with the coach, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi. Uh, can you just tell us a bit about him? and uh, what are the things you learned ab uh, from him actually which helped you in your running i think uh, there's a lot first and most he was a father figure to me and he really welcomed me very well i remember when i landed in japan i met his wife and he told me this is your mom from now onwards because you're here with us and you are our son and i'm your father so that setup already gave me a very good uh, landing platform and understanding that even though we don't speak the same language, the common thing is that we both love running, all right? And, and for me, I always say that uh, they might have looked the coach in a very different manner for those who knew him because he was, he was a war veteran. To me, it is, it is very different the way I look at him because he gave me the opportunity. If he had not accepted me to go to Japan, probably today this com com conversation would not be happening. So uh, I think he was a great coach. He learned, he understood Islam, he understood uh, Buddha, he understood Christian because he had all those books in front of him and he used to read them. So for us, it was just being able to understand uh, the wiseness that he had for us to move to the second to the second uh the second level of life and and one of the areas that when i went to japan i found very difficult was being able to break from 19 years old to beat my seniors it was very difficult because i did not understand what they did i didn't do because i was training every day and uh one day there was an interview and the coach said Mr. Kyushu Nakamura said, if you continue training Douglas, he's going to become so good that we will not be able to beat him. And that is when I clicked and I said, huh, so there should be a crack somewhere in the wall that I need to figure out what it is. And that set me free and I started working hard. And in that year is the same year that I won the Japan National Championship in the 5,000 meters. And I beat all the Japanese uh, runners. Who are, who are good and and you know in japan is like when you are a junior you are supposed not to overtake the senior that is the, the setup that is there you have senpai is your elder kohai is your junior so i was uh, younger than mr seiko so for me beating mr seiko was was, was totally different and understood and it's it's a, it's a it's a cultural break that has never happened in in such areas because in Japan, they have very strong uh, competitions between the universities. The competition is very strong. So when you win at the university level, it is superb. But then they must also cross to the world level so that they can be the best in the world. OK, uh, so that's nice. Uh, so uh, when you actually beat the senior uh, in, in the run, uh, you know, how was the reaction of the senior? Because from a culturally cultural point of view, it was something like, uh, nobody has done ever uh, and you, you would have been the first uh, person apart from being a foreigner uh, to do it. So how was the reaction of uh, those seniors? I think number one is you are cautioned that you should not have a, a long nose. That means you shouldn't boast because that has happened. You should just maintain yourself and be under the, the cultural lines because it's important that you are growing and, and if you step on your seniors, then things ahead of you would be very difficult. But what I learned is that, um, is that uh, the success of a, a young athlete is a pain to a senior athlete, all right? Okay, okay. It is when you succeed as a young athlete and you have... I think the internet is a bit so why the, uh, the internet is a bit uh they, so they have why they, they, they were beaten but then 
the success of a, of, of a senior athlete is 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 a is a what do you call it? It's Nayami. Nayami means it's something that is a stress. It's stress to a young person because okay. you are young. You're competing with the seniors, but that is what makes you strong. Once you have competition in different levels, like you are competing against your seniors, you eventually, when your time to break comes up, you will become a very good, good in whatever you do. As long as you keep the consistency and understand, you have to have patience and then courage when that is necessary for you to to be to, to perform well. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, so within five years of training out in Japan, you won. Uh, you know, like. Uh, like your coach, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi said that you know it'll be difficult to beat Douglas. Uh, you went about uh, winning almost everything in that course of time, even being the top three in the world when it came to uh, marathon. You won the first first Kenyan athlete to win a gold medal at the World Athletic Championship, the first medal, uh, Olympic medal in marathon uh, by a Kenyan, uh, and also the London Marathon. So. So what you are the first Kenyan to win the London Marathon also. So tell us at that time, you know, what clicked because every athlete that that would have been the peak for you. Every athlete would reach a peak. Uh, what were you doing so good and so consistently, which helped you to you know to get to that peak? Uh, number one, let's let's talk about how it came about for me to run the marathon because 1984 was also very good for me, but I did not qualify to compete in the Los Angeles uh, Olympics. So my coach and I, we sat down and started discussing about which event should I work on to go to the Olympics. And my coach believed that the only event that was there for me was the marathon. But then I had no marathon uh, time. So when we finished our ro uh, relays in, in December, I started training for the marathon and because my coach was reasoning my coach's reason was if we approach the world championship i will run probably uh, between 1 and 15 and then i will automatically get a ticket to go to the olympics that is the approach that we took and that was uh, at least one year before the olympics that is how. So I ran my first half marathon, which was uh, 216. I was number six, I think. Then I ran the second one. I ran 215. I was number five. And the third marathon is the one I did two hours 13, which automatically gave me a ticket. Gave me a ticket to compete in the in the in the world championship. Now in the world championship. Uh, Three weeks before we landed in Sweden, where we were doing conditioning. And in Sweden, I ran a half marathon two weeks before, which I did in what, uh, 61 minutes and uh, 40 seconds. It was pretty good for me. And it was two weeks before the, the World Championship. And for sure, I knew I was in good shape. But despite me being uh, in good shape, my coach still was not convinced that uh, I will be able to beat the likes of uh, Rob Di Castella, Juma Ikanga, Hugh Jones, and Steve Monigetti and Ahmed Salah. So there were five big, uh, big names that I was competing with. And given my time, which was two hours thirteen, um, my coach was not convinced that uh, I will be able to perform well. But he knew I will get a, a sizable position, and we will qualify for the Olympics. But uh, I was blessed. And uh, 1987, I won the first gold medal for Kenya. Uh, and, and one of the best things that happened then was that the late President Moi was actually coming into the stadium. And probably, I will never repeat a race whereby you're winning a race and your president is in the stadium. Then the next year was the Olympics. So I got automatically selected for the Olympics. I got a silver medal in the Olympics, which was the first silver medal for the Olympics for Kenya for the men's marathon. The next year, I I, I was in London. And the, the London marathon was a bit tense because we were the same guys who was in the Olympics. And in the Olympics, I believe that I lost the, the gold medal because 
Ahmed Salah basically took off too early. And for me, I was very bitter, but they managed to finish second. So when we came to London Marathon, I was very determined that I'm going to beat Salah regardless of time. And, and, and uh, that is basically what happened, that uh, uh, he, he knew I was there and he announced that he's coming to revenge that I took his gold in 1987. And for us, basically, as, as much as it was a race, it was, it, it was also personal in one way or another. But uh, that one I was ready and, and I, I took it, I think, uh, after 26 miles. Because one of the things I realized he was doing, he was looking behind every time we are running. So I tried to figure out what is the best way to, to beat him. And I would count one, he looks behind, one, I'm there, two, I'm there, I change position. He looks, he doesn't find me, he looks the other side, he can see me. And that is exactly what happened after the 26 miles, we, I was on my left side. If you watch that video of London Marathon 1987, you see so, I was on the left side, he looked one, I was there, two, and I changed position. So immediately he looked behind, I just passed across, and I was six seconds between first and second and third. So I, will, I won the race. Ahmed Salah, uh, Steve, I think either Steve Monegate or Ahmed Salah was second and, and then like that. And, and basically that is, that is how you can be fit, ex exceptionally fit, but you will also need a technique for you to win, to win such a big race. That's nice. It sounds like a motocross uh, racing, you know, uh, changing the sides of the of the lane to ensure that yeah. they can't see you. Uh, yeah. How did you figure out this strategy? I mean, uh, did someone advise you or was it your own strategy of changing sides? Number one, you know, one thing I would I would want to say is that uh, we always try to figure out ways by talking about. For sure, it is not about talking. It's not about reading in the book. It's about everyday practice that what you do on the ground that makes you better. There is nothing better you are going to read about that is not practiced that is going to give you a positive result. So if, for example, if you are training twice a week or three times a week, and I'm here training seven days a week, there's no way you I, I, I learned myself, I discovered myself because it will only be with you until on the start line. Okay. We are not likely to have those coaches who follow us with a bicycle or with a motorbike along the, along the road when you're running. We become independent and self-dependent when you, have, you are on the starting line and the coach says all the, all the best and you live. The other thing I also discovered is that when we run, because for me, I was more of a summer, summer uh, runner. That means running in the heat. I was very good because of the size of my body. I'm more bulky, but very strong, but I'm not very fast. So I discovered that when you run in summer, you sweat on your hand. And then if, you, if your water bottle is cold, if your liquid, the one you drink is cold, it will create uh, water outside the bottle. So when you go to pick the ball, the ball slips and, and, and it drops down. So that is the reason why I used to wear a white glove on my left hand so that I can pick water with this dry hand with the glove will absorb the liquid that is on the bubble. And, and because I couldn't understand how I will put my handkerchief and then keep on removing it and cleaning up my face and whatever, or my hand. So it didn't work for me. So I, I used to use the glove. So those are some of the things you as an athlete must discover, must practice, and must perfect it to just be positive in the race. Okay, that, that's a great explanation of uh, self-learning and understanding uh, what you're doing and uh, implementing that, uh, you know, which will help you. So how was the reception for you when you actually uh, came back to Kenya after winning a medal uh, at the Olympics? Because you are the first Kenyan to, uh, to win it. It was exceptional. It was really, really uh, super good. Uh, but one of, especially in 1987, uh, because I flew from Japan to New Zealand training for a bit like four months, then New Zealand, then uh, Sweden, and then Italy. 
So my team, the Kenya team, did not even know me. They could see that there's a Kenyan, but they have no idea who that Kenyan was. And and for me, that was uh, was 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 quite interesting. Then '88, I think we we landed here with uh, I think five gold medal with our first boxing medal, gold medal. And the whole city went crazy. We had uh, a few vehicles, open vehicles from the airport. And we came, we were taken around the whole city and all Kenyans came in flock. You couldn't see where to pass. And I think that, that, was, that was very good, you know, looking back and saying that uh, uh, if you focus, regardless of, of, of all the negatives in life, you can always achieve something. But these are very few counted moments in your life whereby you can achieve something and be given the responsibility to represent a country, to fly your flag higher in the world and let the person in the world know that this country does exist, all right? So that responsibility is yours and it's a risk you have to take. There's nothing which is gonna be, you can't have everything and say you're gonna train very hard. That is impossible. You have to deny you to deny yourself everything that is good in, in what we term as good in life. You have to have sleepless nights. You have to sleep uh, less hours. You have to wake up very early. You have to go and uh, look for money to keep your life, uh, sustain your life. You have to deny yourself going out. You have to deny yourself probably seeing your girlfriend. And you have to focus because uh, 24 hours is what you have in life. Only 24 hours. And within the 24 hours, you never have 26 hours for anything else. So anything you want, you remove other things in the 24 hours and add what you need. There is only two ways to look at, about, to look at it uh, this way. There are things you need now. You don't need them tomorrow. You'll never be, do, be able to do them tomorrow. There are other things you can, you don't need to do them now. You still do them tomorrow. So you separate the two. For me, I chose that I am going to do to run and prove those who are call, uh, doubting me that they are wrong. That's number one. And number two, my love for running, I said, this is the career I'm going to take. It is risky. I can drop anytime. I can, you know, things can happen anytime in my life, but this is what I've chosen. And I always appreciate every day I wake up and I have to go out and run there because I believe this is the, the real blessing. Okay, thank. That's that's nice. It's um as good as uh, uh, Douglas Wakihuri's uh, tips for uh, being an Olympian and winning a medal. Uh, you know that's that's wonderful. He talked about the sacrifices which one uh, what one is one is uh, one requires uh, to to become a beca become an athlete. So once uh, you won the medal, uh, there's a lot of other people uh, who are winning uh, who actually started uh, you know started winning the medals. Actually, you paved the way for all the other runners uh, to look at uh, marathon as an event, right? Before you, um, uh, there was not many people who were actually concentrating a lot on marathon. They were, we had a lot of Kenyans uh, coming and winning the uh, 3000 meters. Steeplechase was there, uh, quite a favorite amongst Kenyans during that time. Uh, and uh, 3000 meters and 10,000 meters is another favorite. But we never had many people running a marathon. I think you and uh, Ibrahim, uh, were the two people who were pioneers in, in Kenya for uh, for marathon. You're very right. Uh, basically, then marathon was considered as a way out, that uh, when you do the marathon, you are, you are, your running career is done. Okay. And uh, on the other hand, for us, it's that we never had opportunities to be quicker. Because if you look at 10,000, you have people like uh, Moses, Moses Tanui, who had done 27 minutes, you have all these other good runners. So for us, we were a bit slower in, 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 uh, in, in, on the truck. So, so when you come to marathon, at the, at, actually marathon is good when you're younger, but you just have to have the discipline of, of understanding first the, the structure of your physical uh, alignment and the structure of, your, of yourself. You have your organs, you have your heart, you have your brain, you have your muscles, you have your bones. And, and marathon requires uh, 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 reducing your mass so that you increase the the capacity of your energy, the energy of if you have less mass in, you, in the normal energy uh, intake of food becomes sufficient and more than sufficient, and the efficiency 
with a with a lean muscle, you you become very efficient, and of course the the dehydration and dehydration also becomes very low. So this is why I went to Japan, and and for me going to Japan, one of the things that I also managed very well was being able to separate between who I am, where I'm coming from, and where I'm going. And the way I did it is that I tried to understand what I tried to figure out. Being an, a Kenyan 100% will not help me because I've come to a new country, they have a new culture. So how do I mix the two cultures to be one? And one of the biggest number that I realized was good is 100. You can never be better than 100. So what I did, I divided 100 into two. And I say the 50% of Kenyanism, I'm going to throw it away so that I can put 50 of the Japanese that I'm going to learn. And by combining the 50 of Japan and the 50 of Kenya, I get 100. That will make me now who I really want to be. That is one of the, I think, the most successful idea that I ever developed. Uh, being able to struggle because I had no father in life, somebody who I could look to who could tell me what life is all about. I only knew my mother and my brothers. And of course, I used to listen to elder people who were around me, who I could find around me, to just try and, and understand uh, what I don't know that I should have been having around in my life. And, and meeting Mr. Kyushu Nakamura, those are some of the things that he compiled. So he gave me the 50 and I, plus, I added my own 50 and of course, that gave me a hundred percent success. Okay, that's nice. wonderful, uh, Douglas. But but when it came to diet, you became hundred uh, percent Japanese. I mean, you uh, have a serious love for sushi, and you know we speak about Kenyans and their diet, and ugali is one of their favorite food with maize. But you were uh, bought up, or you know, you did extremely well with sushi and rice. So my question was that does it really matter, ugali or sushi? Uh, I think. As I say, where you are, and there are materials that you can use and you can't use everything. So for me, when I shifted from Kenya to Japan, the first thing I did, I immediately chose exactly what I can live with. Rice was good, chicken was good, they have beef, if that's necessary, and vegetables, they have plenty. So I didn't worry about the vegetables. I didn't worry about anything. Ugali, I replaced it with rice. The reason why I chose rice is because if I come to India, I will find rice. So it is almost at the same level. If I go to France, if I go to China, if I go to uh, Egypt, I will still find rice. So for me, when I used to run, rice was a very common uh, material for my running because I knew it is going to stabilize my, my stomach because one of the most important thing in the marathon running is what you eat. And there is nothing you can eat to take you to 42 kilometers. There, is, there isn't. So you'll have to just have a discipline uh, because when we talk about diet, we do not talk about the body, body uh, the time clock, but the body has a time clock. You don't get acids to digest food 24-7. There are okay. times that you used to eat that allows the body to digest. So you can only digest food at this particular time of the day. And those are the body clocks that you work with. So I see a lot of athletes try to run with water, a holding water in running with the bottles or drinking water. For me, my understanding of training is basically having nothing. You train to perfect your body to become better by not giving it what it requires. It is a risk, yes, but I take them when I am resting. When I'm resting, I take the water I need. And again, your water level is 80%. As long as you don't have a dilute concentration that are going to, to draw water. And one, one of the things that I discovered was that dehydration starts when you even haven't started resting, even training depending on what you've been consuming in the whole evening to the morning. And for me, I work it this way. If I eat concentrated food, I will draw water to dilute that concentration. That is natural. So that means I'm already negative in the stomach, in my body. Then I go out and start running. 
I, I'll sweat because of the temperature. Again, I use the same water level, water, water, uh, water level to, to cool myself. So before you even start running, you're already dehydrated. So to balance that is that you must be very diluted in all kinds of things that you take. One of the things that worked for me well in Japan was the rice cake. The rice cake, a piece is about 419 kilocalories. It's a rice cake. It's, it's, it's beaten like to become like a nun, but then it becomes yeah. hard. So for me, the race, the day before the race, I used to eat, uh, I would warm up. You wake up five hours before the race, you warm up, then you start making the rice cake. You take 10 pieces, which gives you 4,000, about 4,000 plus kilocalories. The eating is terrible because it's very slow and it's very difficult, but you just have to swallow them until you're full. So you have four hours to lay around and try to you know prepare yourself so when i start running i'm very i was very heavy because of the food that i have eaten because it, it's very slow in digestion the rice cake is very slow in digestion but when i get up to 21 kilometers now i start feeling very relaxed as i get to 30 the digestion has taken place so when i'm getting to 40 it's just like i'm starting from from zero to one kilometer so i feel very strong I can throw in my my sprints and and there I, I am you know just sprinting uh, to the finish but these are some of the things that you have to to work around and, and understand that no one will ever fix your diet and there is nothing you're gonna eat that is gonna take you to the 42 kilometers you just have to use the negative understanding that you need to eat poor digestion things food that are good for you to be able to hold the time from the start to the to the to the half point, and then you can push to the to the finish. But basically, I used to eat rice was very good. I used to have chicken. I could have vegetables, but I avoided raw fish. Okay. Yeah, raw uh, fish was uh, in, in 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 my in my menu. Okay. So, how many years did it take for you to perfect uh, this diet? uh immediately i started uh, because i was i am not a fancy eater i am not a fancy eater because my background did not give me what i really wanted in life to have full stomach i almost lived with probably very little in the most of the things that i see are not uh, uh, up to the the normal standard of health so we used to eat like bread with a strong tea uh because okay. we, sometimes we couldn't afford to buy milk all the time. We didn't have sodas, we didn't have all this meat, meat we used to eat. We used to buy the, when they, they, they like for example, you guys don't eat cows, <laughs> we, we, we do. So <laughs> like if you, if you slaughter a sheep and you have the oil, first you remove the oil, you boil it, and you remove, separate the oil from the, that remainder is what we used to mix with vegetables as meat because we couldn't afford to buy meat. So my eating habits were never enhanced even when I went to Japan. I almost became very uh, culturally closed in. So I didn't expand my eating habits because there's so much in Japan to eat, but I didn't understand what, what I was eating. And of course, you have all the stories you hear, they eat uh, all this stuff, you know, you start seeing them live start thinking oh this is what i'm eating so i stuck to rice and chicken and you know vegetables it's, it's beans i'm okay with that and of course i i i loved the eel the eel is, is also good that that is was part very good for me so mm -hmm. i just created myself a, a situation whereby i'll have to be comfortable because the main point here to coming to japan was 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 uh, training and then competition okay thank you uh, there's a question with regards to you wearing your uh, a white gloves. So yeah. the question is that uh, you know, do you think uh, it would have helped you, uh, you know, if you had actually worn a headband and a wristband, from uh, preventing the hands from getting wet? The issue with the headband headband was that you also sweating from the head, so it is absorbing all the sweat here. So even if you clean the hand with the band, you'll still have a lot of sweat on your on your hand. Because it is very important for you to pick the bottle when you need to pick it. Because okay. for me, for me, my training was was very uh, very difficult. I made it very difficult because I used to take my water training water after 25 kilometers. So I'll take the first mm -hmm. bottle at 25, 
another one at 30 or 35, and then at 40. So, or, or I could only take two, 25 and 35, and then the rest I finished like that. So for me, taking water was just very easy because I am not used to running with water, but I had to take it when I had to take it because a couple of times I had gone, the bottle has gone down, and I started thinking, what what is the best way to stop? My, I can't stop my hand from sweating, but I can put something that can stop the sweat, the bottle from falling. And the glove was 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 very much okay for me. Okay, um, so uh, you know I uh, understand the reason why you are using a uh, a white glow. Maybe it, it maybe a bit like Michael Jackson, uh, you know, when he was dancing. But uh, a runner using a white glove, uh, maybe you are the only runner who has done it till now. Come again, I, I, I lost you. Just come again. I, I said you would have been like the Michael Jackson of running and, uh, you know, with the white glove in one hand. And I think you must be the only runner who has done it till now. Yeah, I, yes, yes. Because first and most is that you have to understand we, we are all unique. We can have the same body, the same features, but we, we our results is different. If you look at, um, let's say, for example, in, in, in hurdles, even in steeplechase and hurdles, there are athletes who run with, can be able to run on one side, let's say the left side. Then there are other athletes who can do with the right side. But there are, there are, other, there are, there are other athletes who can do both. They can they, they huddle with both, both legs. So again, with me, if you look at winter and summer, I am not a winter athlete. I am a summer athlete. So that means come Olympics, any event that is in, is in summer, ex except uh, like London Marathon, which was a bit in cold and I and I won it. Basically, all my events I ran in, in summer. So for me, I look myself as a much stronger athlete. I was not very fast compared to to the way the winter athletes run. But you must be able to categorize yourself and see where are you best. And if you are best in winter, then you have to be lean. And uh, with weight which is lower, like 58 from 57 to 58. For me, I used to have at least 62. Uh, when I eat, I add up to 64 kilos. So I will actually spend uh, two about two kilos of food, uh, which will will actually gradually uh, go down as I go. So that when I finish, I'll finish maybe with 61.5. I'll still lose 500 grams even though I had I had two kilos extra of food. So basically, uh, those are some of the things that you as an athlete must be able to learn and perfect them because that's what training is all about. You just don't train okay. because the coach is there telling you to go and train. No, you train and try to get the perfect ways and techniques of getting you there uh, the best and produce the best results. Because when you're given a responsibility for, for representing your country, for sure, your 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 next life is going to be as difficult as possible because you cannot tell the the, the public that you are in the Olympics. If it's the law, you represented yes. You which position did you finish? So that will also come in effect that uh, yeah, how good were you, and what can you do to improve that? And that is one of the reasons why I was saying that uh, I know that India has has done probably a two twelve, but I still believe yeah. that they can do better. They can do better. All we need to do is to exchange ideas. And, and, and I believe that the same way I left Kenya to go to India, to sorry, to go to Japan, they can also leave India, get out of the Indian box and start to explore the new things that other people are doing in the world. Because training is what I do, you don't do. And what you do, I don't do. That is basically how you learn to, new techniques about training. Okay, so I mean, I, my question, uh, my uh, f further question was that, you know, so we have an athlete out here who has come uh, closest uh, to beating the national record registered for more than 40 years. Uh, yes. He has done 213.51. Uh, what can he do to do a 2.9 two, two uh, in, 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 in marathon? What are the things he should be doing? So first tell me what he doesn't do. Because I know one thing that he doesn't do is speed. He doesn't do speed work because if you can run 213 it means your stamina your endurance is very good but you're not doing speed work okay if he can change his the way of doing speed work he can improve in the 213 because 
all he needs to do is, for example, if you're doing a thousand meter reps for the marathon, the total kilometers for that speed work should be 21 kilometers. That means if he's doing 1,000 meters repetitions, he has to do 1,000 times 21. So that gives him 21 kilometers worth of speed. If he's doing 400, 800 is the same. You just add up, cut the 42 into half and be able to get that kind of frequencies. And he should be able also to start the, his frequency with 200. 200 is very good. It's very hard for a marathon runner, but it's very good in sharpening the speed over a longer distance. The way speed works, if you run, if you train on the, a good Tatan track, the frequency is very sharp and very precise. So you do more work on the track and then race on the road. That way you will improve your speed very well. And for us, even if you look at uh, Elliot's training, he does a lot of work on the track. So I believe that your athlete probably needs to invest more time on the track. We can help. I can help with programs if he needs. He just needs to understand the technique that is used to do the speed work. You just don't go there and run uh, 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 1,000 times 10. For a marathon runner, basically, that is only one set, and it won't help you. You will have to do repetitions until your body naturally uh, understands the pace that you're running. In. And then there is hill work. You'll have to do hill work in, in like, for example, when you're doing long runs, you, you include very hilly areas to develop your muscles. And of course, you also need to do uh, strength work, you need to go in the gym and do strength work. So there is endurance, you get in mileage and strength. There is speed work that you must do. But before you do the speed work, you also must develop strength because every run you do, it is a negative for your muscle. It drains your muscle. So you have to have specific days where you go to the gym. You don't have to do necessarily do the weights, but you can do push-ups, you can do dips, you can do pull-ups, a rear chin and, and core and, and back, you know, all those, all those kind of uh, exercises you can do. So that now brings you to the uh, uh, core training for the physique itself. Then you come to running. Running also has mountain, has endurance, has speed, and uh, there is physio. You also need to include physio to check your muscle and stuff. And then now there is combination of, there is a now competition whereby you combine now these two blocks into one to get better results. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so he had a subsequent query also. Uh, he's, uh, he was asked me actually, uh, would a sea level practice uh, benefit uh, in marathon? Uh, yes, most of my training I did in New Zealand, and New Zealand is a sea level. Even in Japan, we don't have a high altitude. So it is not the altitude that does the work. It is, as I said, it is if if you you live in a high altitude, uh, because if we look at if we say high altitude is the is, is is the key, then you look at South America. They live under what over four thousand meters above sea level. Why don't they produce the best runners? You see, so basically it is the program and the amount of time you spend on the ground, the frequency of training. We understand training as going out and running, but how many times do you train within 24 hours? All right. For example, everybody says the Kenyan way. Okay. The Kenyan way we train even four times a day. And believe me, it is very difficult to train four times a day. Yeah, but what we are good at is the recoveries in between every run. So that means we wake up very early in the morning when it is very cool. So if you do one hour run or one and a half hours run very early in the morning, you come back at seven o'clock until nine o'clock or 8.30, you have one and a half hours to rest. So before it gets hot, you do relatively uh, not too much, but just an easy run. You can do an easy 10K or even eight. Then you have lunch. Then again, after lunch, you can do uh, conditioning. You can do, you actually do something. So that energy consumption to be able to divide your time, time within a day, it is the key into performing better. And, and then we are also good in, in, in that of, of saying, understanding that you must train 
whether you're going to sleep in between between your 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 mid mid morning training and lunch you have to actually have a snap even if it's 40 minutes that keeps you relaxed very well and then the other thing we also good at is we get very lean when we get leaner we are able to work harder because we have less weight to carry because marathon demands less weight the more you the, the lighter you are the better the, the longer the distance you can move and those are the principles that you as an athlete has to figure out and then of course diet comes in very important that uh, you really don't have to eat so much because diet is is, is about traffic it is how you eat what you eat there is a natural system of understanding diet it is not what you eat to 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 help you it is how the energy is distributed if you eat protein they will take eight hours to digest so you don't need protein that much if you have to have protein you must have them early in the morning because they take eight hours but that means if you take protein in the morning before mid mid training you still have digestion going on because it's protein so you need to eat foods that will help you that, that if you eat carbohydrates uh, like for example for us we don't eat when we wake up in the morning you wake up straight four in the morning or five you go straight to run and you can run anywhere up to two hours without a single food uh, thing to eat even even without water okay. what what that does what that does it basically consumes the previous energy that you had in your body so you are negative at that point right now when you come to eat breakfast you will eat breakfast which will go negative so you will add nothing on your weight because you already removed what you had stored in for yesterday so you are adding new foods they go through the roughage four hours they go back to the storage the storage is empty you are negative so until breakfast you have nothing to save then you go running again you even de depreciate more of your energies because this one are still being processed because it's after four hours you can only eat after every four hours so when you come to lunch is when again you have depleted what you had eaten then lunch comes in again goes down by the time you come to dinner you will find the whole day you have a negative to add on your weight so that's how you become thin that's how you become okay. thin so this is a practice that you as an athlete must practice it's not being told you might love meat you might love so many things but even if you don't eat meat you have uh, uh, vegetable protein they, they, they all serve the same like you have beans will serve the same as protein so uh, what you need to do is to understand that the body does not understand that you eat beef or you eat chicken or you eat what it only understands the chemistry word which is protein uh, uh, starch or carbohydrates uh, fruits veggies and sugars and the fats those are the chemistry word that the body understands so for you as an athlete to consume what you're consuming you must take in mind that how many hours am i going to train and 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 most people think that you have to eat a banana in the morning and so banana will take even more than five hours by five hours you'll have finished your training so you you you'll still punish your body to digest a banana that you're not even going to use so that is the discipline that you as an athlete must keep and maintain and you must wake up the same almost the same timing so that your body clock doesn't mess up so the minute you mess up your body clock like for example you have two months for training you train for two months exactly at six o'clock then the next month you start training at at eight o'clock to mess up the body clock because everything shifts when you have to eat your breakfast so the body clock the body will be confused so those are that is why you 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 have to understand that your body organs work on time everything works on time even your heart beats on time it doesn't skip a beat it beats on time so that is the, the way you're supposed to align everything that you do every single day whether it's eating whether it's sleeping whether it's training in whatever you do this thing called the watch is the most important thing in an athlete's life wow. because if you miss the time basically it means you're not going to the olympics Okay, uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, you have spoken so much about uh, the diet, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of things which people did not know. It is so nice uh, to hear you. In fact, a lot of people are commenting that, you know, it's interesting to hear about the diet. 
So uh, the uh, so I mean the Kenyan way or the Kenyan style of training would that be applicable? Uh, would would it be possible for all the athletes in the world to follow something similar, or would that work in India if somebody wants to follow that? Well, as I said, it's just for you to sacrifice what you have to sacrifice. I know that uh, I know that uh, that uh, we we live in communities that have cultures. And cultures dictate a lot in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives. All right, are you willing to break that culture for you to become a better uh, athlete, whoever you are? That's that's all. That's the key, you know. Because the way I figure it is, regardless of which community you come from, when you're starting training, you will always be called a crazy person. But when you win a medal, the whole village says, "This is our son. This is our daughter." So you must be crazy enough to break some of these rules to be able to make the village or the culture look better. Because it is a risk you're going to take. And if you take the risk, you must make sure that it succeeds. Because if it doesn't succeed, you will kill all the rest of the community members who are trying to become crazy like you. OK. Uh, so I mean, uh, uh, one thing about training, one uh, query has come out here is that uh, what do you think about uh, online training like Macmillan running and other such platforms? Uh, do you think that helps, uh, you know, uh, athletes or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, athletes? Uh, okay. I, I, I myself like to separate two things about training or training program training. And one of the training I always uh, look at is theory and this problem. So having separated them like that, the theory is what you think that your body can do and you have not done it. And what happens when you do it? You find it's totally different because what the theory told you, this is a good training, but the theory did not tell you how long it will take for you to perfect that because this guy did not perfect it in a day, right? You have taken maybe 10 years to come with that saying you you are able beginners can do five to ten miles a week or ten kilometers. So he has taken most of his life to perfect that. So you are reading it on one day and you want the result the next day. So you need to understand that uh, whatever program you, you take, you must invest time in it and practice it because uh, theory is not practical. Okay. And practical must be done. So once you read that program, it means you have to spend a considerable amount of time trying to practice what this program does. And that's what most people don't want to do. They want quick things. I want to run first. How will I run first? You can't do that. You will always, you know, you can't be born today and tomorrow you are grown up. You know, everything, everything has a process. So training is time investment. To every athlete who wishes to do that, training is time investment. I've been running for 33 years. 33 years. You don't want to tell me you're going to wake up and read my story and then just tomorrow wake up as a champion. And then the other thing I also I also do, there is, I, I like to compare uh, uh, practical and ticks. And, uh, practical and theory is in tick. You know the cow tick, the tick that bites the cow or the dog. Yeah, yeah. So I say there are two ticks. One tick is the one which bites outside, and the other tick is in your brain. So which one is the best tick? Okay. It is the tick uh, that you can remove from your skin because the one you want to get it out. Wonderful. So, okay. so, uh, uh, I, I, I give example of, and, and, and I always say that uh, life is short. Uh, marathon is shorter than life. So that's something you can do in the living. As we are in the subject of marathon, you know, we have got uh, the, the, the timing of uh, running a marathon has got gone haywire with uh, Elio uh, Kipchoge running it under two hours. So, you know, what has been the impact of that in Kenya? You know, what are the athletes and coaches thinking about, you know, about, uh, about a, ma a good marathon time now? You, you know, uh, I think... It is not. It is not only Kenya. Uh, we have a challenge. It is the next thing is uh, is uh, first. Let's look at the, 
the calculation of how the event has happened. Because number one, we had uh, two hours to, to, all right? For Kenya, I think is achievable, but we are now hitting the ceiling. We have gone way beyond what we could have imagined. So our next big problem is, how are we going to create the next generation to break a one hour 58 or 59? That is going to be a headache for us. And I believe uh, it's going to take uh, us as a country a lot of work. But that keeps us on a still line as we wait for other countries to come up. All right? So these other countries have a lot of space to break their records. Like, as you're saying, India is 213 or 212? 212. 212. Of year, so you still have a lot of time to come up. It's only that you you just need to understand how things are done, and once you figure it out quickly, you'll be able to break to 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 two ten to two o eight to two o five. You'll be able to climb up very well. But for Kenya, it's going to be a very very hard process for us because now it demands that Kenya start uh, getting into science and technology, and as I say, it is what you do. I don't do or what I do you don't do so Kenya now has to start looking outside what does the other world does that Kenya doesn't do and incorporate that so that if you look at for example the the world record for Nani for Rudisha David yeah, yeah. Uh, Kip Keter held it for 13 years okay a good 13 years so Rudisha has broken it and he did not break a second. It was 0 0.8 of a second. That has taken 13 years. All right? So you can calculate that. For Kenya, I know if you look at our, our structure and our development in, in performing even in the Olympics, in 1968, we had the best lot of our athletes winning three gold medals in the, in the Olympics. Yeah. After that, we had 20 years. So we look at uh, 1988, when we again won again a number, I think five gold medals in, 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 uh, in Korea. After that, it came to 2008 in Beijing. Athlete in the span of 20 years. So what you need to figure out, like for India now, India needs to sit down and look at that cycle how are you producing athletes and at what rate are you producing for kenya it is very slow so if you have the technology and the science i believe that you can work out something that you know because it starts from the pathway the the high the the, the young ones are you like i know like from egypt they start from four years you have four years in school in in, in, in academy playing football playing tennis so by the time they get eight years because four years is olympic year so they have four eight uh, 12, 16, and 20. Okay. That particular time, they will collide with Olympics at work. So that is the path that is very, very key into determining in the next eight or twenty, eight or 12 years, we will be able to produce a certain, uh, certain uh, uh, performing athletes. But I don't know how that works with cricket because you seem to be so good in cricket and that can <laughs> be multiplied running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you have got one of the best at in, in, in the world in cricket. I've, correct, that's right. I mean, we, we just uh, had a good series in Australia. We won it, uh, you know, beating yeah. Australia in Australia. But I think it's all about the youngsters being inspired to become cricketers at a very young age because they have a lot of heroes to look up to. Uh, we have got athletes, but it's only in the athletic community where, uh, you know, people look up to. Uh, but we wanted more youngsters to look up to. That is the reason why we are. Uh, why, you know, why my page is also started to just to try to help others uh, to get motivated. I'm sure when they listen to the interview, what, uh, you know, what you, all the things you've been talking, they will all be motivated. Uh, so yeah. there was a question is that... Uh, Wait, before, you, before you ask the question, the other thing also you need to do is probably invite a bit of uh, international athletes to come to India and, and probably physically meet the children, run with them and get the, get the kids also to ask their own questions because there's also a way, you know, you cannot ask a question uh, for a youngster. So let them integrate. Like, for example, there's the times I used to go to Bermuda and uh, we interact with the children. 
And after that, we, we, we set up a very nice program for Bermuda with my friend of mine called the Vicky Victoria Fidek. She's from Sweden, but she lives in, in Bermuda. But now, after probably 10 years, the, the, the Bermudans, the young kids are performing very well because they are already, they are already probably 18 at now. So that is the other thing that, as I said, the pathway is the most important. So at what age do you introduce the young runners? Uh, even if it means to call to call in a one particular uh, Olympian per year or, or so after a few years, that you can gather good, and then also you get all the sections in India to have at least competition for the young ones and, and make sure that you help them probably in giving them a scholarship to go to school, somebody can sponsor them, so that their parents can also allow them to be able to participate in this sport. Because, you know, as you know, culture is, is a bit, a bit tricky and if cult if the elders are not confident in what you're doing but if they're gonna bring good results because one hard question you're gonna get from the elders is that you know india has not performed well in the years what makes you think that you're gonna do this now and it works you know yeah. but you have to keep pushing someone like you is needed to push the agenda and make sure but you invest in it even as we speak now even me i work well with the with the slum kids i push running into slum kids I also push it in different areas. And in time, I will collect all of them and bring them in a center whereby I want them to, to run with us and talk to us and tell us what they feel, how they feel about it, and see how many of them can... can Yeah, how many of them can perform? I mean, so we would require more, you know, you to come to India. And I, I hope that, you know, we will be able to invite you uh, to come for a stay in India and help us uh, motivate our runners. So uh, there was a question from one of the audiences that um, if you could do it all over again, uh, would you do anything differently when it comes to uh, Douglas Wakihuri's life as an athlete? Yes, I would want to have an Olympic medal, but <laughs> I'll, still, I'll still try and do it in the in the in the Masters. I'm still hoping that uh, in the coming you're, years. You're you already had a you already have a silver medal and uh, the centenary of marathon you were awarded a special medal uh, uh, in greece uh, you know yes. you had a big plaque which the only yes. thing is that uh, instead of uh, waki huri they spelled it as waki huru uh, that's the only mistake they did it in the plaque and uh, i think they should give you a new plaque no 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 a medal is a medal my friend it doesn't matter how it's pronounced or how it looks it's <laughs> Because it's still on your on your neck, as 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 you cross as you cross along, which is uh, not proper. The the medal is a medal, you know. Okay. This took uh, a whole army to conquer uh, Rome, but then it took only one one African uh, runner to conquer Greece, you know. So that's something good. But Absolutely. but um, Absolutely. I I think for 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 us when we were running the winning. A medal was very very key because of our backgrounds you know in and, and i believe that uh, okay. this is something we can help you and, and in becoming uh, there an athlete always has so many questions and so many things despite having a coach you still have so many questions uh on, on how actually you can perform even right here i have a team that i train i have a, a fast coach running club and we all started in um in, in a formal way, by they could do four, five kilometers every day. And we run three times a, a week. And over a whole year, you'll find somebody is able to do uh, 21 kilometers and go into a race, have a medal. And that is very, very, uh, uh, it's very, it's a, it's a very good feeling when, when, when you are able to perform and hang a medal, you know, being uh, seen as somebody who can probably couldn't have never done that. And and the the new team that I have now, they are they are hoping to. It's called Team One Sixty Two in Lavington. They hope to run a, their first forty two in this year in in, in May in, in probably London. That let's hope that things will open up. And this is this is very very encouraging. We've been training for almost one year, and we are able to run uh, by December. We are able to run thirty kilometers. So as I say, it is the, the direction that you have in the courage, the motivation that you'll get. And all the players must be in the same spirit of supporting the, this particular person. If you know me as Douglas where I am, and you have a young person who needs encouragement, don't hesitate to tell me. We can now, the technology now is just easy like we are doing now. So let, let me yes. put, the kid, put the kid on, on online. Let me talk to him. Let me show him what I do. 
and and hopefully that could change you know because probably it, it might take uh, a lot of a lot of years before probably i land to, to in india but if we can okay. be able to even access one on one and and discuss you know once once in a month or, or some time i think that would still be good if that is going to help that particular uh, uh, athlete to to perform better and understand more about coaching i also mentor the, the some people some young ones who, who who are in music sometimes they write they write music and I send them, send it to me, and they correct all that they do. It's just about direction. Because you can help somebody in that direction, and you still go the wrong direction. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. So, you yeah, know, one of the uh, uh, um, one of my uh, listeners, uh, he said, uh, "Thanks, Atan. Uh, you know, tomorrow's speed workout he is dedicating to you." Uh, so, uh, you know, so when you he, when you he heard you speaking, the so tomorrow's speed workout is being dedicated to Mr. Douglas. <laughs> so. What is um, what what is the type of speed work he's doing or she's doing uh, yeah uh, he is i think I, I, um, uh, yeah he is uh, i would say his name is devashish das uh, and mm -hmm. um, uh, he has found his love for running in few few years back uh, you know when he wanted to lose weight and uh, he's a i would say a big positive image uh, in our circuit as a as a tra for for body transformation and uh, tomorrow yeah he's doing 800 uh, he hit 100 meters. Uh, I think he's doing that as a speed work. Uh, How, many? A few How many? How many? How many rounds? Uh, Devashish uh, is what uh, Mr. Douglas is asking. So if you would like to answer that, yeah. I'm waiting for an answer. What is his event? Uh, yeah. Okay. How many rounds? Uh, I'm just typing the message. I hope he answers. Okay then. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, Douglas, the fun fact is that we have been speaking for uh, you know this is the longest interview I've done, and uh, we never felt like you know I've been speaking for so long. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to I know I'm just put you on solo right now. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to ask you this question: Is that any final advice for all the athletes out there if they want to become another Douglas Douglas Wakihuri? A <clears throat> number one is is uh, is for me. As as when I was young, I I dreamed and I wanted to be an Olympian. And as I said, I never had a fatherly life. I never knew my father. But uh, coming across Mr. Nakushi Nakamura, he first opened to me and gave me an opportunity. So I would want to tell you that there will always be an opportunity to do to dream. But you must be ready to face to take the risk that comes with that particular dream because you cannot dream and say i don't want to take the risk i took the risk i left kenya when i was 19 years old i went to japan believing and knowing that this is the only ticket the first one and the last one i'm gonna take and for sure i worked very hard you have to work very hard and and, and there is nothing impossible take time i always tell my athletes that I coach that uh, number one, you need patience, all right? Patience is very key. First, listen, learn, acquire the skill, and then have the courage to move on, to challenge and face all the other challenges, all the other dreams that you wanna, you wanna, you wanna chase because you have the courage, but never get stuck in between courage and patience because you're gonna lose both, all right? So. Uh, if you feel you are talented, you want to, do, you must develop it because I I look at uh, uh, I look at talent or passion as a as a as a parasite. So the body is the host. You need a very strong host for this parasite to survive. So if the host dies, it means that the the, the talent will not develop. So number one, you develop your physique, your body, your mind. You become strong, then the, the talent will develop equally. But you must invest time. As I said, life has only 24 hours. In everything you want to do in life, you are within these 24 hours. You never get a 26 hours. And you can plan, remove what you don't need now, put what you need now within the 24 hours. When that time comes, let them go, put, put in new ones, and life continues. Lastly, life is short. Marathon is shorter life. Okay. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for an interactive session. I just got an answer from my uh, from my uh, from my colleague friend out there. He's saying he's training for a marathon uh, at the end of the month, uh, and he's doing 14 to 16 rounds of the 800 meter speed work tomorrow, uh, no. which has been dedicated for you. No, no, no. I think what 14 to 16 rounds it doesn't work like that. Tell him that one eight two laps is 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 one lap is 400 meters. So what he needs to do is to say he's going to do 800 meters times 10, that is 8 kilometers. All right? That's one okay. set. That's one set. So if he has to do two sets, he has to do 10, 800 meters times 10, then he has 400 meter recovery, and then another 400, uh, 800 meters times 10 or less, whatever it takes. Then he does the addition. All right? Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, and I'm sure he would be very happy uh, to receive a personal coaching from a champion and, and legend, uh, you know, in a short, such a short span that shows uh, your big heartness and, uh, you know, your your willingness to help. It's been a really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, and uh, most importantly, it was such a knowledgeable session for all the people who are listening. And I'll be putting it uh, as a small clips for others also. So I just wanted to thank you very much for your time, Douglas. I request you to be on uh, in the studio and a big namaste. And I would say, uh, uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, you know, for for coming in and giving me an opportunity to talk to, uh, and uh, most importantly, uh, you know, listening to you. Uh, so uh, just give me a minute. Let me just thank my audience uh, right. before I, I just I, I'll just come back to you. Okay, uh, so thank you very much uh, for coming in, and all of you, uh, Devin, I'll get back to you with your answer, with the questions, um, and uh, most importantly, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this month, uh, yes, uh, Olympian Corner is for uh, All India Runners Motivation, and not only really Olympian Corner, Olympian uh, you know, medalist, winning medalist. Okay, so people have won medals is what uh, we are looking at, and on 26 Jan, on our Republic Day, we have got. Uh, a famous uh, runner from South Africa. Her name is Elana Meyer, and uh, she is a, a medalist for 10,000 meters. Who will be coming in? And at the end of the meet, uh, end of the month, we got another. Uh, I would say uh, a great Kenyan runner, uh, which Douglas would obviously know. He is called as the Daddy of Steeplechase. Uh, Mr. Moses Kiptunoi would be coming in also to address our runners. Uh, so keep your questions coming in, and. Uh, and thank you very much for coming on a, on a, and wish you all a very happy weekend. Let me just speak to Mr. Douglas uh, in a few minutes.